Welcome to the Answer Podcast, where we share stories of leadership, service, and the journey of amazing professionals in the maritime and the military community. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo, and today we have a special guest, Lieutenant General Grade Melanie Arroyave from the United States Coast Guard. Uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Junior Grade Arroyave is the aide de camp to the first district commander. She has an impressive career from managing one of the largest commercial ports on the East Coast to supporting North Korean defectors in South Korea. Before we get started, I want to mention that the views shared on this podcast are our own and do not necessarily reflect the official policies or position of the U.S. Coast Guard or any other agency. If you're listening on Spotify or watching on the YouTube on the Answer YouTube channel, do not forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the notifications so you never miss an episode. Melanie, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing tonight? Hi, Manuel. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it to, to have the time to have this conversation in the Answer podcast. I appreciate it for being here. Um, I know you're working, so, <laughs> so we discussed that, right? So it's late night, it's, a, it's Monday, and it's uh, 1900, past 1900, you're still working. But okay, we're going to make this quick. Um, so talk to us, so to, the, to me and the audience, to who is Melanie Arroyave? Who is Melanie? Well, first and foremost, um, I always identify as Colombian-American. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the Northeast, and I preface that because I think when I first went to college, I met other Latinos from all different types of the like parts of the country. Um, and I started realizing like, you know, we're all Latinos, but we all have very different experiences. Mm -hmm. Some people were raised on rural areas. I grew up in the city, okay. uh, Jersey city, right across, um, from the Statue of Liberty. Okay. Um, my parents immigrated in the eighties from Colombia. And so one thing I will say is, uh, you know, in light of Hispanic Heritage Month mm -hmm. and being, being October, definitely Colombian American and, and a coasty, a proud coasty too. Mm -hmm. So that's who I am. Yeah. And then, how, so how's the life in, in, in New York? You know, is is I hear it's, it's tough. I mean, is that's the big apple <laughs> where like, you know, like the jungle of the concrete, you know, living like through, through that as a Hispanic, you know, how, how was it back then? Oh, um, I would say definitely concrete jungle mm -hmm. um your neighbors speak all different types of languages i, I grew up in an apartment building mm -hmm. all my life right mm -hmm. i didn't gotcha. until i joined the service and i started getting some bah mm -hmm. oha um i always lived in an apartment building and so for me it's like you know you would open your door and you're getting all these different aromas just inundating you mm -hmm. and for the most part it was very good but you you start learning really quickly uh, the different cultures, whether it's Asian, whether it's African, whether it's Middle Eastern, South American, Central American, you just, mm. you just, you, you grow up with this so closely that you think the entire world is like that. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and so I was very spoiled in many ways. And when I would, when I moved um, for the very first time after, you know, uh, high school, I was like in for a shell shock because I was mm. like, whoa, like, America is not a reflection <laughs> of where I grew up. Like mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a very special place and I'm forever grateful for that experience. Yeah, diversity most than most definitely that's something that you can find in, in New York City, um, as amongst the you know, other areas. Now, so let's go and focus on your military experience or you know, so what actually inspired inspire you to join the Coast Guard and pursue a career in the public service? What inspired me to mm -hmm. join the Coast Guard? Um, probably, and I really thought about it today. Mm -hmm. um, today, I actually, in the Coast Guard, we have the most notable life-saving um, lifesaver by the name of Captain Joshua James. And I went to boot camp in 2018, and I learned about him. Mm -hmm. And I still knew about him, and I, I, you know, my background within the service is being a response officer, having a small boat experience. And I I didn't really get to appreciate him until mm -hmm. today where I went to a museum and um, I, I learned that at the age of 10, he lost his mother and sister mm -hmm. um, to a, a small boat um, incident. And he was 10 years old and that marked the rest of his life to wanting to save other people and mm -hmm. never to have to lose a life on water. 
And I think that really connected with me today. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, I joined the Coast Guard in 2017, really mm -hmm. applied through the 2017 Latina Symposium. Mm -hmm. I okay. never wanted to join the military. Okay. Like I was told Melanie mm -hmm. College. Mm -hmm. um, but I joined because my mom passed away when I was mm -hmm. about 16 years old. Um, we had a car accident together when I was a year old okay. and she was a quadriplegic all my life. And, you know, I, I was young when I lost her and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, she lived in a nursing home because she was in, um, in a predicament where she couldn't, you know, move. And so she was like, her brain was still there. Right. Oh. And she mm -hmm. uh, underwent a lot of, um, a lot of struggles. And I, I thought I would go into the medical field because of that, mm -hmm. but, um, as I started looking at the, the different military branches mm -hmm. um, at the Latina Symposium, I mm -hmm. found gotcha. a mentor who mm -hmm. told me, hey, we stand for life-saving. Mm -hmm. And nothing wrong with my DOD counterparts. We mm -hmm. do good work on the mm -hmm. other, I promise. But I, for me, it was like it spoke to me, that life-saving mm -hmm. um, aspect. My brother's a paramedic mm -hmm. and a firefighter. So I think in a weird way, all of us kind of went into fields where we wanted to help other people. Mm -hmm. um, the way we would have wanted our mother to be helped. And so in some way that that's what spoke to me to do public service, but also to join the Coast mm -hmm. Guard because at the core, it's a life-saving service. Right, right. No, it's, it's a, thank you for sharing that story. I mean, like a story about your mom and um, your background. Like I, I know like that makes you stronger, you know, and make these decisions that you are like Mel the Melanie you're today is because those decisions you made back then now it, i keep hearing like the latina symposium i know that's a powerful tool right and then like you keep referring back to the latina symposium can you actually speak now that we're in the subject like how what is the latina symposium for the listeners that who doesn't know and uh, how inspired you to actually join the, the coast guard back then so the latina the national latina symposium is actually um put on and sponsored by a magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Bard, Robert Bard is, is, and his wife, they're mm -hmm. terrific and they lead it. Um, I volunteered actually. Um, I received an email um, in 2017 to volunteer for it. And I was a civilian and I was like, wow, Latinas in the military. And I just saw that as an opportunity to vet the branches mm. and so i was a broke college student not a lot of money and i was mm. like wait i get to uh because i think if you did weren't military or weren't volunteering you had to pay and i was like i can volunteer my time at this point i had already moved to jersey the symposium was in dc i took a one dollar megabose uh stayed at union station woke up at like 7 30 a.m to go volunteer and it was there that i met um now retired commander yamadis Barrill. And she was a product of the College Student Pre-Commissioning Initiative, which is a program I ended up applying to, and that's how I joined the Coast Guard. Um, it's like the closest thing the Coast Guard has to ROTC. Mm. Um, and I met her at the mm. right time. Talk about like stars aligning. Um, I was a sophomore um, that could apply because the program only pays for the last two years of your college, mm -hmm. guarantees mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. a slot in officer candidate school. Um, but the symposium really at its core is it allows all the Latinas from each branch to be recognized for the good work that they've done mm -hmm. uh, within their service within that year. And you get nominated, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't understand any of this, right? I barely understood rank. No, it's, it's okay. And, was, and, and it's okay mm -hmm. because this is what we're mm -hmm. trying to steer the conversation to, right? Because like this is a tool for mentorship for people that actually are listening to us and they don't know like as you were back in 2017 2018 this is a great conversation so no more than welcome yeah and i i you know i saw the uniforms and um my my joke is i i i didn't i gravitated naturally towards the coasties they were the ones volunteering at the tables the other folks um, I think the army kind of like got me a little scared and the Marines really, I mean, they look great, but like, I just gravitated naturally towards the coasties. Um, and they, they really embraced me. And I, at the end of the day, I, I thought they were national guard, right? Cause coast guard, national guard, very similar, but a small nuance. And so it was kind of uh, a learning curve for me at the time I had the opportunity to, um, as a volunteer, uh, escort the flag officers and general officers to one of their panels. And I didn't know what a star meant. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, one of them was a Coastie Admiral by the name of um, Admiral Sandra Stowes. And she said she was the superintendent of the academy at the time and said, hey, Melanie, like, uh, if you're considering the Coast Guard, I recommend this program called C-SPY. And luck luckily enough, there was a product in the audience, uh, the commander I talked mm -hmm. about that ended up recruiting me and was with me every step of the way when I put in my package. Um, so that mentorship was key. And, and, mm -hmm. and to this day, uh, she stuck with me. Uh, when I was stationed in Virginia, she came down and, and uh, she was going to retire shortly after me putting on, um, you know, Lieutenant Junior Grade 02. And so that was really big. That's a full circle moment. Um, prior to her retiring, her biggest thing was she wanted to nominate me mm -hmm. to the Latina Symposium. Oh. The very symposium we met at. <laughs> and I was a civilian. Oh. And fast forward five years later, she's nominating me. And I get it. Nice. And I didn't know. Actually, it was sitting in my email <laughs> for like a month. And I didn't acknowledge the how, how significant this was, not only for um, the Coast Guard, but the, my community. Mm -hmm. And for me to be a volunteer at the symposium and then be at the other end receiving an award, um, it was it, it, it really made me proud um, to, you know, reflect my mother's legacy, right? Because mm -hmm. at the core, that's that's kind of why I joined. No, and, and, and again, congrats about that. A big achievement. Um, it's great to hear stories like this. Like, okay, so you were a civilian before, and then fast forward, now you're getting a word that in the same spot that you actually thought about joining the Coast Guard. Um, but it's amazing to see, to hear that. So, so now when you submitted the packet, so what was next for Melanie? Like, okay, so now you made the decision, let's go back in time. Okay, so now you got the courage to actually go and serve serve uh, in a military branch, specifically in the Coast Guard. So now what's next? Okay, pack it and then next. What is it? I would say I'm probably the last person to ever want to join the military. But when I put that package in, it was because of opportunity and what that meant for um, for my education, right? I get, I get to finish college and get my bachelor's, but also like I always wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so I learned about the judge advocate general and I was like, what is a JAG? And um, I'm still something I'm trying to pursue in my career. And that, that would, is what I've been striving for thus far. Um, and I've, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. I've always wanted to do good work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's, I think that's what's next. Manuel. Yeah. Okay. And then, so back you were talking about something in particular that I asked you, uh, it would come my attention. Can you speak about the uh, loose scholar in South Korea? So that was a unique experience. You were, you did a lot of stuff. Uh, you, you, in that time you supporting the North Korean defectors and working, you worked on a documentary. So how this shaped your outlook and career? Because you can speak more about that and what that entails to you. Oh man. Uh, so the Lose Scholars Program, um, it it's it's a it's a distinguished fellowship, right? Mm -hmm. So I was um, I went to Rutgers University. That's where I went to school. I'm a big Jersey kid, and um, mm -hmm. I I actually transferred, right? So my first year of college was uh, at a at a university in Washington D.C. I transferred over, and I studied public health and labor. And I had good grades. I think my first year I didn't do so great. I'll be very honest. Um, but when you transfer, you start from zero. Um, and that really helped me out. And when you do that, I, I knew I'm a first generation college student, military, American. So for me, it was like I really didn't have like my mom or dad to really like, you know, help me in school. Mm -hmm. um, but because of that, I, I knew my second year, like, what it was to do proper study habits, what it was to have, you know, maintain good grades. So because of those good grades, not only did I have opportunities, but I was able to apply to fellowships like the Loose. Mm, okay. um, and the Loose was an opportunity. It's really, um, they only choose 18 Americans um, to go live oh. abroad in Asia. Mm -hmm. Henry Loose um it's his fellowship, but it's his legacy. And he's the father of like Time Magazine, Sports Illustrator. And he lived, he's American, but he grew up in Asia, I believe China um, in the early, don't quote me, like late 1800s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And he saw the 
the the value of having Americans get exposed to to Asia in general. Mm. And so that's the core of it. But really what it is um, today is uh, 18 folks are selected out of about almost a thousand folks that mm -hmm. apply. And then um, you go through a very rigorous uh, interview okay. process. Mm -hmm. And essentially what they do is says, okay, we want you and we want to send you, we would like to send you to the XYZ country. Mm. And uh, we want you to work there for a year and we want you to either stay there or come back but we're going to give you you know full fl like full range on a country and we want you to be exposed and we want you to be cultural ambassadors mm -hmm. and nice. really it's meant for folks that have no exposure to asia at all mm -hmm. and um i wanted to do the loose program and go to philippines okay. uh, i grew up with a lot of filipinos so mm. i wanted to go to the philippines and i wanted to work with labor workers um because they make up 25 percent of merchant mariners i had this plan let me just say that i had a plan <laughs> okay. right it sounds like i have a plan it I sounds plan. like you you had the plan like for to do this <laughs> but then, but then but what happened <laughs> covid 19 right oh, okay. and so like, I'm, a, I'm about to graduate college i mm. have this program i'm still in the coast guard so now i'm like coast guard can i go can i go do this mm -hmm. and at the time i was enlisted i was an e3 on paper and um my chief my my e7 was like like not extremely supportive if i must be honest but that's okay uh because you know he he, he was good enough to send it up mm -hmm. and when he sent it to headquarters headquarters said this is awesome and then they were like all right, Mel, we're going to let you do this, but you can't go to the Philippines. You have to go to a safe country. Mm. And the only safe country that we know mm. is Korea. Okay. And so I was like, whoa, uh, I've been studying language for Tagalog, Tagalog. and to go to uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And now you want me to go learn Korean? Mm -hmm. I don't even know anything about Korea. Like I didn't, I wasn't a part of like <laughs> the Korean wave of K-pop or k drop That wasn't me. Bim Bim so Bob. Like, so you had, you no, had to. <laughs> I didn't. Come Samida. I didn't even, <laughs> Come and, yeah. and now yeah. I can read, I can write, nice. I can speak it because of the program. Um, and so then I'm like, okay, all right, Coast Guard, you're going to let me go, but I have to go to Korea. Okay. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. I'm going. And so then I go to Korea. I actually, uh, I had to do a two week quarantine on Camp Humphreys. So yep, large I, base. I know, I you've know been, all of it. You've yeah. been? <laughs> yeah, I've been and, in South Korea and I know all about Camp Humphreys. Yeah. Have you uh, lived there? No, so I went for for multiple trainings when I was in 25th day in Hawaii. So oh, wow. I was in Daegu, I've been in Daegu. Thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, Camp Walker. That that's so you know you so yeah know. that's why it's that's why I, I i was i can say thank you <laughs> and at the bim bim bob and the korean <laughs> uh barbecue yeah amazing food um amazing food they have in korea south korea actually yeah so then they were like okay we're gonna okay but mel you're going to korea and now we're gonna give you a job mm -hmm. and i'm like well i care about human rights i care about law what are you gonna give me and okay. they were like they were like, we have this great job. You're going to be working with North Korean defectors. And I was like, wait, why? Yeah, crossing like, the border the between North Korea and South Korea. Because Camp Humphrey is close to the actual border. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And That's so then like I was almost like... Almost zone zero uh, down, down in Korea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I was mm -hmm. like, okay. the fact I was so excited, but at the same time nervous. Like, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even know defectors like that. And was I wrong? Like, I was... I was I was so blessed with this experience because mm. there's not may very many of them and they speak a little bit differently um, because um, the Korean language has been South Korean language has been extremely been influenced by, by Americans. By the West. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So their mm -hmm. language is like, you know, they use ice cream to describe ice cream, but it's like, like ice cream is not a thing. It's like me, if I'm from Puerto Rico and I have a Spanglish. So we is immersed the English and the Spanish. Same with, I think, Korean and, and they have the uh, the rock, so the rock army, you know what I mean? So it's yeah. a very westernized, you know, community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They call it Konglish. So it's funny that you say, they <laughs> okay. call it Konglish and it's a thing. And um, 
So I got to work with defectors, but mm -hmm. really, you know, there wasn't a lot of folks that defected during COVID, but mm -hmm. essentially we would do intake um, and, and help them acquire resources. They have, so South Korea has one of the largest rates of suicide um, in East Asia um, mm -hmm. amongst especially young folk. And in, in the North Korean population, it's even higher, right? Because maybe you got to see this, but if you don't, grow up in Korea or speak Korean or are mm. Korean, it's really hard to be a part of like a Korean culture. Like you, you can make friends, but most of them want to have exposure to American culture to begin with. But if they don't, then it's really hard to be a part of that culture. And the biggest thing is, you know, how old are you? That's like the hierarchy. Like how old are you? Uh, where, what school did you go to? If you can't answer that, then that's a lot, that's very difficult. And for a lot of folks that don't want to disclose their status about being um, defectors, sometimes they can't help it because of the way they speak, the accent gives them away. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I'm very familiar with, right? Like I, it was also kind of odd, right? Because in Korea, I was identified as American, mi guk saram. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm American? I was like, I've been growing up as Colombian all my mm -hmm. life, and now I'm American. I'm like, wow, okay, so there's like a whole new identity of being American. Mm -hmm. and But I understood the North Korean defectors because I felt like it was the most extreme form of of migration, yes. right? And that's something yeah. my parents did. They migrated, mm -hmm. and I got to experience the struggles that probably my dad went through and my mom went through when they first came to this country. And I was experiencing it on a different level, in a different place, mm -hmm. um, with different privilege. Um, and so I knew expats, but I also knew migrant workers. Mm -hmm. um, I not only interacted with the North Korean community, but I also got to explore the Filipino community, right. and that's what's I, I, I managed it right because I was like, man, I still want that connection <laughs> to Philippines. So I ended up finding. So, so you found um, a way to go to actually the Philippines. I found a, no, not to go to the Philippines, okay, but, but in the, uh, the, the same. In, in yeah, the the Korea, the Filipinos living in Korea. Okay, the Filipino community in Korea. Gotcha. Correct, mm -hmm. and and connecting to them, and they were so hospitable, but. You know, it just ranged. You know, I'm, I, I, I engaged with a professor. Most folks were migrant workers or um, marriage migrants. They mm. married into, uh, uh, you know, to a Korean, mo mostly in most cases to a Korean man, uh, female to male. And then it, it, you know, it ranged from students, students, you know, coming on visas. It just, the gamut ranged. Wow. But it was a story I knew all too well being in the States and seeing, you know, grow, growing up in New York City and understanding what status meant, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Are you are you here legally, illegally? And that's always like, you know, a point of topic that people are like, oh, whoa, whoa. But it's true. And mm -hmm. that's something I not only got to see locally growing up, but I got to see something across the water abroad. Wow. Yeah, no, it, is a, it sounds like it was a fun and enrich, uh, enrichment to you, actually to your personal and your actually uh, military career because you can actually take those lessons learned and, and bring it back to your community now. So let's sh switch focus now. So now let's talk about to your current role as the aide de camp to the first district district commander. That sounds like a very important position. And uh, now, can you tell us like what your day to day look like and and your main responsibilities? Oh. Now, with with the add on that is uh, seven thirty six or nineteen thirty six, and you're still on the <laughs> and you're still on the office, right? You're still working. That is correct. Yeah. Um, we're actually. I'm in. They call it a representational facility, uh, but they're hosting. A, we're hosting a party right now. I don't even call okay. it a party, but a reception. A reception. And so I'm, I'm in. I'm like in the in the barn, uh, <laughs> and, okay. and and tomorrow we go to we 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 go. We're on a trip. We just came off a trip last week, but we're on a long trip this week, and so I'm preparing for that too, um, <laughs> and, and hoping you know this will finish up. I have some great folks that work with me that are taking care of this, so um, they they let me do this in nice. a good way. Nice. Um, but what does the day to day look like? Mm -hmm. um, it, it differs. It mm -hmm. truly differs. I started my day to day on a on a um a forty five foot uh small boat uh that saves lives and that transferred us from the um 
we passed the Boston Lighthouse. We went to Station Point Allerton. It was just, uh, in this job, I get to travel a lot, mm -hmm. um, a lot of exposure. Um, but the day to day is really being the timekeeper mm -hmm. um, to my principal, to the admiral, and to balance to do visits, to transport, mm -hmm. um, to do engagements with not only congressional delegates, um, international delegates, mm -hmm. DHS. Um, and so it's, it's truly, it runs the gamut uh, right. from doing itineraries and pre-planning to executing those plans, to communicating with folks, to, you know, managing expectations. So the true key, I think, it may be the challenging part to the job sometimes is uh, managing expectations, mm -hmm. both personally, but also to other folks. Um, and so it's a super rewarding job. I've only been doing <laughs> it since May, but man, it's nonstop and it's fun. Nice. No, no, <clears throat> most definitely. It's a great experience. Again, you keep gaining that, those experiences to, for your personal and again to your uh, career, professional career. And being a de cam is a very selective uh, for those that are trying to apply. I mean, people apply, and then so only the few get selected to be a de cam. In this case, you got selected to actually do this job. Uh, now, so the next thing I have here, and you, uh, you work with the Commandant's Advisory Board on Women. So, what are some of the initiatives uh, you're working on there, and why is this work is is important to you? So the Commandant's Advisory Board on Women was a congressionally mandated uh, group um, mm -hmm. and also an application process where um, a few women were selected. Oh, not all women. A mm -hmm. few members of the Coast Guard. We might need to edit that part. A few members of the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. um, both active duty, retiree, and reserve come together to really... Um, make not only the lives of women better in my opinion but to make the lives of coasties better mm -hmm. but the intention is to focus on the recruitment retention of women the well-being of women the education and empowerment of women and so we have three subcommittees that focus on that um i was luckily and lucky enough to be voted um onto the executive committee. So there's subcommittees and then the executive and the executive committee. I, I, over, I assist in overseeing the other committees and assisting them in, in drafting their, their plans, so mm -hmm. to speak, and um, what goals they want to carry out and synthesizing that. So I'm a part of that effort. I'm the, also the, the youngest mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm also the only Latina on the board. So I'm proud wow. to represent. Um, and that means well, right? Cause I'm, I'm not sure if you do this, but you go into a room and you're like, Am I the only one? <laughs> like, am I the, am, like who, who? Who? And that's okay. That's that's half. Mm -hmm. That's half. Of, that's half of it. But it's almost like okay, because I'm the only one. I need to make sure that I carry myself in a manner. I mean, that's it's anywhere and everywhere. But I need to make sure that I'm, I'm doing the best I can to represent the people that put me here. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the roles that we're doing is I know the recruitment and retention team. Um, we're coming out with a. There's a similar organization or, or, or committee called Dakowitz, and they're much older than we are, very different than we are. Um, but essentially, we're coming out with a, a, a list of our recommendations, and one of them is going to be focused on geostability. And we've looked at how the DOD does it and how you know DHS um, does it a little differently. Um, we're also looking at uh, creating a junior officer leadership uh, man, uh, mandated program, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of us go to different accession sources. So we go through officer candidate school. We go to the academy. Um, some of them are, some of us are, res are, are reservists that get commissioned. We get, you know, there's multiple commissioning sources and we would just want to make sure whether you got four years of, of, of leadership experience going to the academy, or if you got three, uh, weeks of Rocky, um, no matter what, we want you to have a basis of just leadership because I think um, that's that's what the, the subcommittee decided on focusing on. Um, and another thing is training. So focusing on interactive training, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm, I'm sure that we're not so different in terms of the DOD and the mm -hmm. DHS department where like we do mandated, mandated training mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, instead of it being 
just online solely so you can you know check off the box and get it done it's it's for you to do it interactively and you to actually get something out of it and so those are some small efforts right we're brand new brand new so we're still learning as a team um and a lot of storming norming performing in a good way and uh all for us to provide recommendations to our commandant Mm -hmm. um admiral admiral lando fagan yeah, and again, this is uh, it's a great resp- responsibility, and then like you, ha- you are the only Latina on the board, and that's a great to hear. You know what I mean? And I'm proud to actually be the Colombian American, American like actually on the board uh, providing your insights because you can actually bring to the table other you know point of views, etc., from your standpoint. Uh, and provide those recommendations. That's, that's great to hear. Um, it's a lot of work that you guys are doing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You, you, you're you're very busy. <laughs> to be honest, you are the, a very b- busy person. <laughs> this is it's it's been it's been fun, right? Yeah. Like I, I think I thrive on being busy. So yeah, this is, that's it's great. rewarding. Now, before the role of the ADC, you work in at sector virginia and manage responses in one of the biggest ports in the u.s what were some of the toughest challenges you faced there and how do you lead your team through them oh man i was that was my first tour mm-hmm. as an ensign mm-hmm. right and so you're an oh one and you're mm-hmm. a butter bar and no mm-hmm. matter where you are you're a butter bar mm-hmm. and so I, I i i so to speak cut my teeth there um i uh, being in the incident man, incident management division I was working at a sector, so there's um, around 30 plus sectors across the United States that fall under districts, but um, it just gets smaller and smaller as you go. So I worked at a sector, Sector Virginia, and then I would fall under the response department. Mm -hmm. And then within that, I worked at the incident management division. And what I really did was pollution response um, on my day to day. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a week long standing duty 24 seven for one week and Tuesday to Tuesday. Um, One of the biggest cases I think that I can easily recollect was probably early on actually as a break-in. And it was a, it's, it was a helicopter crash in, in uh, Shinkatig of Virginia. And it was um, in a, in a, in a net, like a, a natural marsh, so it was a very sensitive, environmentally sensitive mm-hmm. area. And then you have this, you know, we have a loss of life as well. Um, mm-hmm. One of the pilots didn't make it. Oh. Um, so there's a lot going on. And so the Coast Guard worked closely with the Navy because um, that, that's what, where the asset came from. And it was just, uh, for me, a very beautiful thing to see um, the Navy and Coast Guard work seamlessly together. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, respecting our jurisdiction and authority, but we we doing the same. Mm-hmm. And that was really early on in my career. I mean, like really early on in that mm-hmm. tour. Um, but then some other cases that that um that I think of um are just the ordinary pollution cases you would get because most times um you would they they'd be from your DoD counterparts, and so it's almost like talking to Big Brother and saying, "Hey, Big Brother, you just polluted." <laughs> You know, and, and then it's like, like okay. you know, and then Big Brother's like, I can do better, right? And so that was shocking, right? Because Big Brother, um, like the the other DoD counterparts could be like, no, I'm not going to do anything about it. And in fact, they were quite the opposite. They were like, all right, Coast Guard, like we're going to respect it. So it was actually really cool because we're such a small service that like sometimes, um, it could just be like you know we're being written off, and I it that really, really challenged. Uh, really, in a good way, changed my perspective on that. And so that was one case, too. Um, and then when I became a federal on-scene coordinator, so you start off as a pollution responder and federal on-scene coordinator and working cases um, where they were smaller. Uh, they were like, you know, the the daily, like, a sunken vessel, and now there's oil in the water and how you go about that. But what that does is, like, it creates uh, – um, there's the Oil Liability uh, – Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund Act. Mm-hmm. So it gives – basically a pot of money of the Coast Guard to to utilize in the event that there's not a responsible party um, identified. And so if you can't, there's like this, these checklists. So it's really like that really taught me like these are a bunch of checklists you have to go through. You have to make sure that you're legally abiding. It was just so many moving parts as a, as a butter bar. Hmm. And the Coast Guard was giving me that responsibility. Wow. And so I thought that was um, really beautiful. 
Um, I, while I was at the incident management division, not only did I do pollution response, but I did boat crew work at the small boat station out in Little Creek, Virginia. So I was, I got qualified on a small boat, um, being a boat crew member. And that was huge because, you know, it really, you feel that team dynamic and they're mainly, um, you're working with enlisted petty officers. And I was like most, most, most times the the only junior officer mm -hmm. and it was working that dynamic but we're close in age right so it's always that dynamic of like we're close in age mm -hmm. but we're like in a different dynamic but um made some really long lasting uh friendships doing that work because you're on a boat together mm -hmm. uh responding to a search <laughs> and rescue call and it's it's fantastic i love that experience um so between boats pollution response, and then a little bit of law enforcement while I was there. So uh, definitely a really good place to to start off my career mm -hmm. as an officer. And it gave me the opportunity to to do what I'm doing now. Um, so Yeah, it opens opens like uh, your possibilities of different works. And, and definitely that's the keep building your resume as we, we keep hearing, you know, from South Korea, from the pollution officer to now to the ADC ham, you know, everything, you know, keep, keeps building up. And like you mentioned, you, you're trying to, to be a JAG. <laughs> so that's, you keep building up your resume. So once you're ready to apply for it, I, I bet it's going to help you through the process. Now, so is, I know we keep hearing you're a busy uh, person. Uh, Melanie is busy. So you keep working outside the Coast Guard, like you volunteer for, for like the Girl Scouts and you involve in the EEOC in New York City. So I, how actually you can actually manage in balance like these activities within work and, you know, outside <laughs> the outside as well? I mean, I think the biggest thing here is that they all happen at very different times okay. in my life, right? Like okay. I worked, I worked at the EEOC um a few years back gotcha. um when i was at uh in in new york new jersey i volunteered avidly for the girl scouts um i used to kayak a lot more when mm -hmm. i lived in virginia mm -hmm. um and i all my hobbies podcasting all that like that the different parts of me and i still am connected to it mm -hmm. um it's i can't dedicate the same amount of time right. at, at this moment mm -hmm. but uh they're all part of like my hobbies and, and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. Um, in terms of working at the EOC, um, did some mediation. So really like just taking transferable skills everywhere I go and um, just wanting to learn more. I think the, op you know, we, we talk about like, you know, I that's a lot. And I think at the end of the day, what I've done is I've never really like pinned myself in my interest to one thing. Mm. I've, you know, if I'm interested in something, I'm like, oh, that's cool. But I act on it. And I think that's the biggest difference, right? Like if you have something like, hey, I, and that's something I, you know, when, when I've been mentored and when I share experiences with people, it's like, okay, you have a dream of doing Jag, right? That's my dream. Mm -hmm. Or you have a dream of doing, I don't know, like being a pilot. My first question is going to be, okay, like, what are you doing to get there? Mm -hmm. And how badly do you really want it? And uh, something I asked myself that question, something I offered to other folks of, because once you start, you know, dreaming, creating a dream is great, but then realizing a plan for it, that's a goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's huge. And I think it's a mindset, truthfully. Um, yeah. And if, if you can adopt that, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah, most definitely. Now, so what about you're a member of the ANSA community and NNOA? Can you speak more about what is the answer for those doesn't know and they're like first timers in the YouTube and the Spotify? Can you explain what, what are those like agencies do and then uh, why you're a member of those communities? Absolutely. So ANSA is an affinity group for the nautical services. So that's your Marine Corps, your Navy, your mm -hmm. Coast, Guard, Coast Guard. And essentially um, something unique to the ANSA, I, I believe, is that it historically was designated for officers, but they're open mm -hmm. to all. And I, when I say all enlisted, active duty, retiree, um, reserve, mm -hmm. um, officers, and, 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 and people from all walks of life, like you don't have to be Latino to be an ANSO. Mm -hmm. And that's something I like to tell people all the time. Like you could, you could join It's for, it's for camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really, for me, it's been 
one of the first things I did actually when I moved to Virginia, because when I got orders to Virginia, I was like, oh man, where am I going? <laughs> um, but the, I, the first thing I did was I picked up I picked up my phone and I was like, all right, I'm I'm looking for my local Anso chapter, and I'm, I'm gonna get connected to mm-hmm. see, you know, uh, what, f- what, f- what where am I gonna eat for food? Where can I get good food? Or you know, culturally speaking, um, how am I gonna make friends? But how am I also gonna like? do my personal development but also my professional development so really it's it's a little bit of all like if if you're looking for a place to want to be mentored and offer some mentorship to others this is a place that's the way to do it Mm -hmm. um and so it was actually uh present when i was at that Latina symposium mm-hmm. um, in 2017. So I mm-hmm. knew about Anso then mm-hmm. before I even knew about the Coast Guard. I was like, what's the wow. Coast Guard? I knew <laughs> about Anso before that. And I was like, wow, like, this is cool. You know, Navy, Marine Corps, what's the Coast Guard again? Mm-hmm. So um, that that was early on. And so, and then fast forward, um, Commander Burrill, she was from Puerto Rico and she was a member of Anso and she spoke highly of Anso. Um, and then I meet all these other folks later because of ANSO. And I was like, man, I, ANSO is a beautiful organization mm-hmm. because of what it represents and what it stands for. So for whoever's listening that doesn't know what it is and mm-hmm. wants to look into it, it's really a place for leadership and professional per, uh, personal development mm-hmm. and having folks that truly care about you and invest in you um, mm-hmm. in your in your endeavors. No, most definitely. And then like... Uh... I can speak up for myself. Like uh, I'm from I'm from the army, and I'm managing. I'm a soldier, <laughs> so, but I'm That's in the true. ANSA community, and thanks to again uh, the presidente, Lieutenant Colonel Montalban, that he approached to me to actually run this project, and and I think ANSA is a great value. It doesn't matter you're from the sea services, Latino, non-Latino, officer, non-officer. They offer great tools for mentorship. Um, they're about to do the, their symposium. They did the Eastern Symposium um, a couple of months ago, and then they're about to do the next one in December. So look out on the anso.mail. So ansomail.org, ansomail.org, or find them on YouTube, on Facebook, or Instagram as ansomail. You can find more information on the Western Symposium. It's open to all the services. Doesn't matter if you're a Marine, or Navy, Coast, Coast, or Coast Guard, and Army, Air Force, and again, open to everyone. And it's a great tools as a mentorship for all the services. And yeah, so and again, Lieutenant Colonel Montalban, appreciate it for for making you know Melanie to come to the podcast. So Melanie, um, so what advice would you give to somebody that's listening, that's contemplating? are in the same shoes you were back in the Latino Symposium and you were trying to find out about any of the services. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give that person that's listening right Mm -hmm. now that contemplated to join any of the military services? Well, I would say, honestly, find somebody you can relate to. Find someone that can speak to your goals and dreams, whether they are what you, they epitomize what you want to pursue. Um, but really find somebody that believes in you and, and focuses on your dreams. I would say I was at a crossroads joining either the Coast Guard or pursuing academia. And I remember having these two opportunities, academia, Coast Guard. And I remember when I spoke to one of my academic advisors, um, who was also Latina, and she was like, Melanie, if I could do it all over again, I would I would have joined the Air Force. You can come back here to academia. Academia will be here for you. Um, and so with that said is if you're if you're looking for an adventure, if you're looking an opportunity, um, any service really will provide you a secret clearance. Any service will, re- will provide you um, and, and, and supply you with your Maslow hierarchy of needs, really. Um, so just just think about it and and act on it. Right. Don't sit there and fester. Really try it. Try it. Sign a contract for mm-hmm. one to two years. You could say this isn't for me and move on. But guess what? Now you have veteran preference. You have all these benefits waiting for you at the very end. So you can't really regret this choice. So if you're on the fence about it for whatever reason, um, even feel free to talk to me. Mm-hmm. You can find me um, yep. and we could talk about it. So 
Yeah, so oh, so you can actually find um, Melanie. I, I, she might give me like the point of comp uh, point of contact. I can put it, I can drop it here on the comments below and on the on the actual introduction of the podcast. Uh, you can find the social media pages of the Anso community, and then we are all for it. Like this is what we're doing this to mentorship people in the other end of the of the spectrum. Um, Melanie, any other uh, any other comments and uh, before we start wrapping up this podcast, it, it has been fun and a privilege to actually have you in the answer podcast. Thank you, Manuel. Um, honestly, thank you for doing this. Right, mm -hmm. you said army. It didn't really connect to me that you uh, you're not like that's that's awesome. Thank you for doing what you do, mm -hmm. and um, I'm really honored and privileged to be you know on the podcast. Like that's this is huge. So. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for letting me be a little bit of representation and inspiration. No, of so course. I appreciate it. Of course. And then we, before we head out, I want to make an announcement. Uh, there's a, a, a couple series of training for those that are listening, a series of trainings with El Puente uh, in, in the ANSA community. Uh, the next training is going to be 7 November uh, 2024, November the 7th, 2024, at 1800 or... Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time and the uh, theme of this training is going to be setting setting personal goals and it's open to everyone that's want to attend through zoom to the zoom link for more information you can actually follow our social media uh, linkedin youtube um, instagram and facebook and if you want to join that training section with the puente and the answer more than welcome open for everyone that wants to attend well melanie appreciated the time and, and again uh, get back to work and we're having that you know that party that you're hosting right now <laughs> so, <laughs> okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna be closing i appreciate it again um so let me see for, like here so thank you for joining us today uh thank you to melanie again it's been an honor to hear your story and the impact you're making for our listeners i hope you found inspiration and insight for this conversation if you enjoyed today's episode episode please like subscribe and follow the answer podcast on spotify and the answer youtube channel your support helps uh, help us to bring more story of leadership and service to our audience. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Caro, and we'll see you on the next episode. Do not forget to hit that notification bell to stay updated on our latest episode. Uh, let's go, mi gente. <laughs>